marketing for PNC, so um, it's a financial institution, so I can't talk about a lot what I do at my day job, but I can talk a lot about what I do at my night job, which is teaching at Point Park. So this presentation is going to be really geared towards someone who wants to teach or start teaching and how to engage students. Um, oh, there you go. Ah, sorry about that. So here's my information if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Berg Daddy, so it's not really a professional Twitter account. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, if you want, if you teach full time, you probably don't want to mix personal and professional Twitter accounts. But in my case, I'm an adjunct and I can do that. Um, I mix them. My LinkedIn is um, up there too if you want to follow me or connect with me. And I put a hashtag up here if you want to ask questions. I have a Twitter follow. We can um, go through those questions as I go through the presentation. So again, um, you know, I'm not a professional instructor. I do it part time, but I really love what I do. I don't do it for money. I do it to really give back. I went to school mostly at night, and uh, most of my instructors were really good at what they did because they were so good at um, their full time jobs. So I teach to sort of give back to the community, and that's why I started to teaching. So this presentation is going to be about how to build that interactive classroom. So this first slide does this look familiar to anyone? Does anyone have kids? You have kids? Oh yeah, okay. that looks exactly like them. I have kids oh, too. Only a tab. Yeah, so I have kids gross. too, and um, <laughs> this is really the new reality. They're not um, they're not learning with books and then digital. They're learning digital and then maybe never books. I actually went back to school to get my MBA in 2007, and I was in the workforce for I guess six or seven years, and I actually had a hard time reading books, like literally re picking up books and taking notes because that's not what I did during my day job. I was on the computer, I was visiting websites, and now we have this whole generation of kids that are being brought up with iPads. I know I have two kids and they're iPads, iPhones, they can work it better than I can. So how do we continue to evolve and engage with this audience and really transform um, the, way that we, the way that we teach? So I've been teaching for a couple years now, and a couple things happened where I realized I really needed to change the way I taught my students. Um, so the first thing that happened, it was actually over the summer, I had a student from Montour High School. Is anyone in that school district? Someone close to it? So uh, a student job shadowed me. Job shadowing is kind of interesting, by the way. You have to make your job seem exciting for eight hours. It was difficult. Um, and I did my best to do it. But he, he job shadowed me, and he, ta he told me that he goes to Montour High School, and it's paperless. They don't use books. <laughs> They don't take tests with paper or pencil. Um, they use PCs, and um, that really kind of blew me away. And I said, wow, OK, so this kid's graduating from Montour. Then he's coming to, let's say, Point Park. And we hand him a book and say, take notes and learn from this book. He's going to struggle, because we're not teaching him the way that he's been taught in high school. So we really need to change the game on how instructors engage with students, because they're really changing the way that um, they learn in high school. So I thought that was pretty amazing. And if anyone's not aware of that, I think Montour is just one example. I think a lot of schools are going paperless. So um, pretty amazing and a thing to look out for. The second thing that I did that realized I needed to change the way I teach is I'm taking a class at Stanford right now, and it's using software called Coursera. And it's free. And um, it really is amazing software. And it's I'm receiving a world-class education. And it's different than anything I've ever learned from before. So you have video lectures that pause. So in this case, they have breaks right here where the instructor will actually give you tests, breaks. And I feel that's the way students learn best if you just don't talk and you take breaks and ask questions. And I'm, I'm watching this and realizing if we don't change as college professors and instructors, um, we, we may be forced to change in the future because the technology is there. Has anyone taken a class at Coursera or any other online universities? You have? Not there, but another online. Yeah. What was your experience, anyone? Uh, I, iTunes U. Okay. Sort of. Was it, was it a good experience? Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. And you, you went 
to Western Governors University in okay. Utah, and I think it's, a, it's been a great experience. Yeah. So I've I mean, never heard of either of those, but that's... It's the only um, non-profit online school, and it's actually um, international. Very cool. So, but that makes it cheaper because it's a non-profit. Yeah. So these are just some of the schools that are signed up with Coursera right now that offers free courses. And um, I think there's 33 in total. Yeah, 33. So you could say courses at Stanford, Ohio State, Brown, Penn. I mean, these are top tier universities where students can go online and learn. And um, the experience on the, in these online schools are pretty amazing because they, you know, they use video, they integrate social media. It's a digital classroom. And um, again, when I, when I viewed this, I figured this is, you know, looking at what they're doing, I really need to change the game on how I teach as well. So the third thing that happened to me is I just jumped in and I'm not a blogger. Um, I'm not a professional blogger. I actually never blogged before. My blog was up for about a month or two and I spelled blog wrong up where it says point part marketing blog. I forgot the L. So that was kind of embarrassing. So I'm not, yeah, it was really embarrassing. But I'm not a professional blogger. I don't know WordPress. I was never trained in WordPress. I just used it and learned it. And a lot of things I'm going to talk about today is to really get in and engage with your students, you have to get in there and start using the tools. So I started using this blog as sort of a online test and see, I wanted to see how, how the students would interact with, act with it. And so far it's been going great. Um, their assignments are due on the blog. Um, I put material on the blog such as notes and slides so they have access to it. Um, and, and so far the engagement's been much better than um, when I've taught previous semesters. But this was a start. I, um, there's a lot of other tools you can use, and I'm going to go into those tools of, of what you could use and how you can start to build. It's not all about blogging. Some of your tools might be Twitter, it might be Facebook, or it might be some, some instructors using Pinterest. I mean, anything's out there. It's really what your engagement style is. So I tweeted this out using the hash, hashtag, and this is a, a study that was done by Pearson Education. They do a lot of the books, and it talks about, you know, who is using social media as far as the uh, educational community. And this slide, it's kind of hard to read, but the bigger piece of the pie for professional use, they're not using social media in the classroom. So they're getting there, but they're still not using it. And this slide is the use of social media by age. So you see younger instructors are using it and starting to bring it in, but there's still a lot of opportunity to bring social media into the classroom. Anyone, this slide make, um, surprise anyone or, no? So this next slide is interesting because, um, and this, this slide right here came from that Pearson study. It, it is how instructors are using social media, which ones they're using and how often. So you see at the top, they're using Facebook more often than any other social media, LinkedIn second, and then Twitter third. But on this graph on the right, it's, it's social media growth by, um, by Twitter and age group. And Twitter is off the charts. And I did an informal sort of survey in my marketing research class, my marketing management class. And I asked my students, what social media tools are you using and which one do you prefer? No one said Facebook. Um, not one student said Facebook. And they said, I asked them for reasons why. Some of the reasons I got were, my mom's on Facebook. It's not cool anymore. Um, that makes sense to me. I mean, I... I didn't friend my mom either when she sent me that friend request. Um, they're all using Twitter. They said it's a fast form of communication. Um, it's quick. They're used to texting and they're used to communicating like that. So if we're starting as instructors to use Facebook and ramping up, we still might be missing the ability to engage with our students because they're, they're using a whole new medium. Now, you know, there's a lot of details in there. Like, should an instructor follow your students back? You know, you might want to have um, a discussion about that. You might want to figure out what your school social media policies are um, before you do anything that I'm discussing today. That's important. I don't want to tell you to do anything and then you go do it and then they, can, they come chase down bird daddy because I said it was okay to use Twitter to engage with your students. Um, but just some important stats to think about. Make sure you're using the right tools. These stats surprise anyone? Or <coughs> Just What's that? We were just talking about we it just a little bit ago. About we were... Yeah, about the Twitter use. About yeah, I said uh, that there's you wouldn't believe how many teenage girls are on Twitter, and it's because their parents are on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's also I find students aren't using Twitter like 
as a resource, they're just using it as spewing like whatever they're feeling in the moment. Yeah. And so um, it's interesting they don't know how to harness it as much as the as powerful as it could be. So, yeah. Yeah. I agree. They're not. And they use hashtags wrong too. That bothers yes. me. They use a million hashtags. Yes. I don't know when that. I think it actually started with Instagram, because Instagram, if you post a picture, you're like hashtag morning, hashtag leaves, hashtag pretty, and they use like a hundred hashtags, and that's not what hashtags are meant to do. But that's probably for another discussion, anyways. On, on hashtags and other what kinds. do kids always do what they're supposed to do? Yeah, exactly. So all those facts are great, and you're probably asking yourself, okay, I know about the stats and students are using Twitter. How do I get started? What are the tools to get started? So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, the tools and what you can use. Um, and this um, session and PodCamp was all about, you know, choosing your toolbox. There's a variety of tools out there for upgrading your education. You can use Blackboard. Um, Blackboard has some tools where you can use it to its fullest potential. You can blog on Blackboard, Facebook, WordPress, LinkedIn. I think that's Prezi. Prezi is an awesome tool. I recommend that um, you try to use it. It's, it's a little bit hard to learn in my experience, but um, once you get it, your presentations become a lot better. I didn't use it for this one, but I should have Twitter, SlideShare, Tumblr, Course Sites. I've been testing out Course Sites pretty extensively, and I think Course Sites is going to be sort of an innovative game changer for education. Um, Course Sites lets you build a blog and lets you build online tests and lets you integrate Twitter and videos and all of these things into the classroom without you having any prior knowledge of you know web design or blog design or anything like that. So if you are an educator, definitely check out Course Sites. It's free. You can build an online resource today and start testing it out. I have some screenshots later in the presentation about Course Sites. So these are all the tools. Um, again, there's a ton available to you, but your first step before you choose any of those tools is what you really want to do is choose your engagement style. So if your school has a very strict social media policy and you're not allowed to you know, have a Facebook page for your classroom or you're not allowed to use Twitter, you might just want to have the awareness level. So the, the first level is awareness I'll talk about. Um, and then you just want to use these tools, get familiar with them. So you need to use what your students are using. I often like to use the um, example, would you trust an auto mechanic that didn't really work on cars? Should these students trust instructors that aren't up to date on social media? I know that I wouldn't because it's not really um, relevant in today. If you're just learning from a book and you're not engaging, even if you can't engage, make sure you learn the tools. So that first step that I talked about is sort of level one. And this didn't come from a book or I'm not a social media guru. These are sort of um, terms that I made up. This is Level one is really about awareness, knowing the tools and starting to use them. So the tools here might be Twitter, they might be LinkedIn, they might be Facebook, and, and they might be Pinterest, there may be some more Tumblr might be in this one. So sign up for the tools that your students are using. Sign up, start using it, make sure you know what you're talking about. Um, start following influencers. So start, if you, say you're teaching, you said you teach Spanish, right? Okay, you teach Spanish, maybe follow um, people that teach Spanish or teach science or, or whatever you're teaching, make sure you're following those influencers and get ideas and, and, uh, that you can share with your classroom. Learn the systems, start to develop your network, and um, separate personal from school and never mix the two unless it's a, a appropriate. So your students don't care if you're you know, going out on a, drinking a case of beer or on, on a Friday night. They, they might find it funny, but I don't want you to get in trouble. You should probably separate your professional, your professional networks with your personal interest if you teach full time. If you're an adjunct, that might be different like myself, but um, just be careful what you post out there because you now have a, a larger audience from everywhere. So these tools, and I'll actually tweet these out, these are some of the best tools that I've ever found on learning these social networks. So these usually, these most of these come from Mashable. So it's really, you know, we're talking about using an education. This is really the Twitter 101 or the Facebook 101 or LinkedIn or um, the Pinterest 101. There's a lot of guidebooks out there. So really figure out what you want to use, what tool, and then go and use these guidebooks and it shows you how. So who to follow, how to retweet, how to quote tweets, kind of all the, the things that you'll need um, to, to start using these tools and engaging. Has anyone used these tools before, these how-tos? You have? You, good experience? Yeah, I like, um, I think, does is the Mashable one link over to the Twitter's actual Get Started Guide? Because I know the Twitter Get Started Guide was really helpful when I first joined and getting clients on there. Yeah. So, 
I don't think it does. I think it's separate. Okay, maybe yeah. I haven't then. But yeah. I know the Twitter guide, when you go into help and you go to all that stuff, I know that's helpful as well. Yeah. So good guides. Again, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll tweet these out using the hashtags. You can follow them again. But it's a really good resource for anyone learning the tool or anyone trying to get better at the tool. Um, you know, you learn things every day. I think in the Facebook, someone did a Facebook session yesterday. I didn't know you could schedule posts on fan pages. That was something new I learned just by going to these resources. So um, definitely stay up to date. That's that level one awareness where you want to make sure you know of all the tools and, and what your students are using. So level two about using social media in the classroom, this is where you're really collecting a lot of information. So you want to build up your network, you want to make sure that you're following the right people and you're collecting information and you're becoming sort of more intelligent on the things that you're teaching about. Um, establish your online profile, build your network, um, collect this content and bring out the best to your students and encourage them to follow you for updates. So this is all about growing your network, keep growing, sharing, learning, and you can use a variety of tools for this. One of the best tools for this that I found is LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn, once you have a, a pretty robust profile, it actually builds in a news feed of things that you're interested in. So my news feed includes marketing and social media and um, you know, teaching in the classroom. I can then collect that information and sort of share the best out to my students offline or online. So I think this is a good example of um, teaching in the classroom and what a collector is. This is a syllabus of a, a teacher. I just pulled it offline. And um, she actually has a blog. She has um, a Twitter hashtag, and she has um, her Twitter handle on her syllabus. That's kind of new. Um, and that's kind of game changing right there, that they're starting the class and saying, hey, follow me in class, but also follow me outside of class. I'm collecting information for you, the students, and um, I thought that was a good example of that. Has anyone ever seen a syllabus with that type of information on it? No? I think you're going to. I think it's, it's going to happen pretty quick. Um, if teachers want to continue to engage with their students, that it's probably a good idea to give them the instructions up front how to um, follow you. So add your social media names to your syllabus. Encourage students to follow. Keep content updated throughout the course. Um, at this stage, you really should be committed to sharing what you're learning in social media throughout the course with your students. The first two levels make sense to everyone, awareness and collector. How do you organize? How, like, when you're collecting stuff, what do you use to kind of keep it organized? So there's a variety of tools on what I use to keep it organized. Um, I think I have some examples when I go into the next stage, which is curator, which is taking that collection into the next level. Um, but for Twitter, I, use, I used to use TweetDeck. So with TweetDeck, you can have a bunch of search terms like um, you know, social media, marketing, um, and when I worked for Giant Eagle, I had Giant Eagle and Market District, and it sort of put, puts all that information in columns. It's hard because with social media and when you follow more and more people, it's hard to really capture all that data. It moves so fast. So there's a variety of tools. You'll probably have to test out a bunch of tools which works best for you, um, but I really can't give you the best one. It's all about which one works for you. Um, Hootsuite, I think, has a lot of good tools that people use for that type of thing. Are you on LinkedIn, Twitter? I'm on all of them. OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. So this is just an example of sort of that collection. This is my LinkedIn profile. And I work in marketing. And some of this data is you know, automatically given to me. I will um, often sort of re-engage information. Like this was internet radio trends. So a lot of things that I do at work are about um, you know, new New, new ways to uh, market using interactive marketing. So Pandora trends and, and Spotify trends. So this is something that I would capture and maybe you know, use in my um, classroom as an example. So definitely LinkedIn is a good resource for the collector. So this is um, the next level. And this is really where you start to engage with your students on a much, much higher level. And um, I call this the curator phase. And this is where. Um, you're sort of repurposing the content and customizing it for your students using a variety of these tools. So you have large data feeds coming in about things that you're interested in. And these are tools that um, you want to customize and, and give to your students to make them more useful. So customizing posts and content with the best of the best. You can reblog at this stage. 
Um, curators don't dump. Um, I think that's one thing to remember. You don't want to share everything that you've found. You want to make sure that it's the most relevant information to your audience. So if you just retweet everything out there that's relevant to your class that you're teaching or the students that you're teaching with, you, they're probably going to shut you off and ignore you. You only want to share sort of the best of the best. Would any, any of you out there consider yourself a curator? You would? Emily, you're a good curator. So I follow you do share sort of the best of the best. So I, I would agree. So you asked about tools. This is one of the tools that I use. I don't know if anyone else, anyone else use TweetDeck? OK. What's that? Work on a flyer by Twitter. Oh, really? OK, so TweetDeck was a good one. Does it even work anymore? or? It still works. OK. I just didn't like it once it got acquired because it couldn't shorten the URLs anymore. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. No, that's, I mean, I, I, I like TweetDeck and I, I used it. This was sort of an old example, but I thought it was a good screenshot. This is sort of an example of the overflow of information. This is when I worked in marketing for Giant Eagle. So I had a search for Market District, a search for Get-Go, a search for Giant Eagle, a search for Grocery, to really understand all that information coming in. And I was probably a curator at that time where I wanted to know what people were talking about. I wanted to collect information, but I also wanted to curate it as well. So using a tool like this, where you can customize your feed and what you're looking for, is sort of a best best practice in using social media in the classroom. But again, you can use any tool that you want. You can start blogging at this point, but you really want to share the best of the best. So that next level, level four, or you know, you can use any level that you want to use or, or make up terms. This is where you really want to create the information. So now you're not just collecting, you're actually creating. You're starting to blog. You're starting to, um, you're starting to tweet content that you've developed and that you've, you've created yourself. Sometimes it's based on what other people talk about. And here are the tools that you can start using here. LinkedIn is definitely a good one to create your own content. WordPress, I use WordPress for my blog. I've gone into some examples of the things that I've used and done. Blackboard, Blackboard's still a good tool. One of the things that I don't like about Blackboard is um, the fact that your experience as an instructor on one end is different than the experience on the student's end. And that's one of the things that I still don't like about Blackboard. And they haven't, I know they're working on that, but they haven't changed that. To have a good graphical user interface, I think the two should be consistent. Because I want to know exactly what my students are seeing. And that's one of the reasons why I don't use Blackboard and I use the blog, because I know exactly what they're looking at, because it's the same. Course sites, which I have an example of what we can go into, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so this is a level where you want to be engaging with your students. Um, engagement can be different based on your goals that you establish. Um, keep pushing the students to engage and keep pushing yourself. This is tough. When I first started my, um, my teaching blog, I thought it was great. I blogged every day. I was pumped up. And I said, look at me. You know, I'm, I'm a blogger. This is awesome. It's really hard to keep this stuff updated because it requires you to stay on top of your game. And it also, it's a time commitment too. So I work full time and I teach full time or part time and now I'm blogging. It's really, you need to find time to do that and really dedicate it or it'll kind of fall off your radar. And you're probably at this stage when you're creating for your students, you're gonna be using more than one tool. You're not just gonna be using WordPress. You're not gonna be using Facebook. You're really gonna be engaging with your students on a, um, a different level. So there's a, um, I tweeted this out a little bit earlier but there is a, um, let me see if I can get this mouse to work, hold on. There was an infographic that pretty much was saying the same thing that I'm saying as well. Um, I tweeted this link out too for people that are following on the hashtag. And their keys of engagement were, let me see here, connect, notify, teach, curate. So sort of, sort of similar to what I had as well. But the different, the different levels are, you know, what could you use Facebook for if you're a teacher? You know, make a Facebook page for your class where you can schedule events, post notes, and remind students of assignment due dates. That makes a lot of sense, and they'd probably follow. Um, improve communication by allowing students to easily message teacher and other students with questions. That makes sense as well. So there's all the tools are listed here under the different levels of engagement. So with Twitter, um, some of the things that you can do is follow other educators that are teaching things that you're teaching, so you're staying up to date on the things that you're teaching. Pinterest, I finally broke down and signed up for a Pinterest account. Um, it's the social media site for that's really targeted towards women. But again, I, I felt that I wasn't up to date and I didn't know 
what the tools were, so I signed up and I'm starting to learn that. So I don't know a lot about Pinterest, but I'm starting to learn it. But these are all the tools. I've seen people use Pinterest to sort of um, critique other students' work for design classes, so they're posting their designs on Pinterest. I've seen them um, post their work on Pinterest and people engage with it. So definitely a good way. I think Twitter's a good tool here, Facebook's a good tool. And then they have um, what I use down here, the blog, and how you can use that. So what are instructors using the blogs for? Post daily or weekly homework assignments on the blog. I do that. It keeps students up to date. If they have to miss a class, they don't have to go to the syllabus or follow an email. They simply go to one site. They follow the blog. And they see what to do, um, post discussions on topics. Because my, pre my presentations are due on the blog, I think it sort of forces the students to spend a little bit more time on it. Because they know a couple of things. They know that not only will I be reading their assignments, but their students, will, their fellow students will be reading their assignments. And also sometimes um, people from outside my classroom come in and pitch into the content as well, which I think adds a whole other level of engagement to teaching in the classroom. Um, publish student work on the blog, have students set their own blog. I think that's a really good idea as well. So again, I tweeted this link out. I think it's a great infographic on using all of these tools in the classroom. It's saying, what I'm talking about today, but just in a nice, pretty graphical sort of way. And infographics are, are definitely becoming popular because of that. Anyone have any questions before I keep going, before I keep talking? Is this information good to everyone, hopefully? OK. Do any of your students ever comment, like, why do I have to be on Twitter in order to follow the class? Are they kind of like into it, or are they just doing it because they have to? So I think with the blog, I, I, haven't, I haven't used Twitter yet. I plan to do that in the future. Um, with a blog, it's about 75% 75 or 75 are all for it. There's about 25% are like, ah, I don't know what you're doing. Why do I have to go here? All my other teachers are using Blackboard. It doesn't make sense. So there is a little bit of pushback. But once they start using it, I think they're starting to like it. But yeah, there was some pushback at the beginning. And amazingly, so, you know, do you have a question? Oh, I also have a comment to it. Okay. Your statement just from that. I went to Point Park, and one of my professors actually encouraged us to be on Twitter, be on LinkedIn. She's actually the reason I started LinkedIn. And at first, I was very cautious about it because I was like, well, why do we have to do this? But looking back now, four or five years, it's actually really benefited me as a marketer now. Now that I've decided what I want to do with my life, just because it gave me all that additional experience without actually having to do that for an internship or anything job related. So it really ends up helping them so you can always spin it that way too. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. So I was teaching my marketing research one class and we actually went pretty late. It was about quarter to nine and we got in this LinkedIn discussion. And um, one of them asked me, you know, what, what do you know about LinkedIn? Can you help us set up a profile? So I'm like, sure, any, anyone that wants to stay, you know, let's set up a LinkedIn profile, but anyone that wants to go, go ahead and leave. So every one of the students decided to stay to that class because they knew it was that important for their careers and it's something that they weren't learning. So they're really interested in this, but they're not really getting the education elsewhere. So um, they definitely want to learn these tools and they're really excited about them. I think we stayed till like 9.30 that night talking about LinkedIn. So if you want to start a blog, it doesn't have to start pretty. This is sort of how I started my blog. Um, you really want to just jot down what you want your blog to be, what information you want to have on it. And that might look kind of scary to you, but uh, my blog turned out a lot simpler than those graphics. That, um, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to include on your blog? What are the most important things? It's really, you're a creator now, so you're really determining what are the most important things on your blog that your students will be interested in. And that's sort of where you lay it out. You, you don't have to do a sketch, you can do whatever you want. But you want to take some time and figure out what your blog is actually going to look like before you, you, know, you jump in and start to create it. So I created a digital, digital, having trouble talking out of cold, like I said, I apologize. I created my digital checklist for my blog. These are the things that I knew that I wanted. The first thing was easy access to notes, allowing my students to download, study, and sort of view on demand. That's all about this generation and Generation Z. They want to pull the information down. They don't want to have it push to them. They're not using email, so if I talk about chapter two, they want to download chapter two when they want to download it. I thought that was an important piece of, of um, what I wanted my blog to be. And as I started doing this, a lot of the students commented that 
they really appreciated this because paper waste was an important thing to them in the environment, and most of their teachers were just handing out stacks and stacks of paper. They liked the fact that they could view the information online, download it on demand, but they never had to print, have to print anything. So that was first on my, on my checklist. The second thing on my checklist was sort of an engagement center. I wanted sort of the center to be where students could turn in assignments and where they could share, so that was another important thing. I wanted to use videos. In the classroom, I find that if I take breaks and show short videos, they help to inspire <coughs> and get the students more engaged. I mean, when you're teaching a three-hour class on a Tuesday night, the students worked all day, I think video is very important to include to help that engagement um, and also to help so they don't fall asleep. Links to resources I knew my students would use. Again, this is really the information on demand part of the equation. So instead of sending them out an email with, hey, you might want to check out the Bureau of Labor Statistics site for future employment trends, or you might want to check out the US Census Bureau, instead of giving that to them sort of in piecemeal, it's all in the blog. So they know how to get to the US Census. They know how to get to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they only have to go to one place to get to it. Um, and there was, I also wanted to measure my engagement to see how I was doing. And I built my blog in WordPress. Again, I'm not an expert. I just learned how to use it on my own. But with WordPress, I can simply go on and see when the students are, are logging on, when they're visiting. So I know if I need to step up my game or, or maybe engage them a little bit more, I can look at when they're actually visiting the site by day. So I thought those were important parts of the puzzle. So that was my digital checklist. And if you're interested in creating a blog, if you're interested in using a blog in the classroom, good first step is to create that digital checklist, figure out what you want, and then build it from there. So this is how the blog turned out. And the first thing on my digital checklist, I said access to notes. So I used a couple tools here. I used SlideShare to actually upload the notes. So there's nothing hidden about where my notes are. And there's simply links to every note in the chapter. So if they want to go back and look at chapter two, or go back and look at chapter three, it's easy to access at any time. So that was built in using the links tool in the WordPress blog. So nothing, nothing high tech there, just simply adding links to SlideShare. Does anyone use SlideShare? Yes. Okay, SlideShare is an awesome tool. Again, you don't have to save anything. I, download, I upload this presentation to SlideShare. Once it's there, it's out there, and you can access it from anywhere. You don't have to worry about carrying a zip drive or you know, using Dropbox, because Dropbox has some security issues on different things, simply added a SlideShare. Now, if you're teaching something confidential that you can't share, I wouldn't recommend that you use SlideShare, but there are security tools to SlideShare where you can only give certain people access. Have you tried any other plugins that allow you to do it in-house? I have not. Do you I, know of any? No, I'm looking for one for a church site that I'm building that they want to be able to upload their PowerPoint okay. directly to it, and I was hoping you would say, yeah, I'll use it. Yeah, no, I mean, the only one I use on an everyday basis, there's there's one that I use, which is SlideShare, and one that I'm checking out, but I'm not good enough at yet, which is Prezi. So Prezi really lets you build dynamic presentations. What's that? I said I love Prezi. That's what I yeah. was going to say if you didn't mention anything. Yeah, Prezi is, it, it looks awesome. I'm just not good at it enough yet to share what I know. So I think between those two tools, they're definitely worth checking out. So again, the students can go out here, they can download. They don't even have to download, they could just um, view the slides and, and click through them. So SlideShare is definitely a good tool that I wanted to include in something that you might want to think about for your teaching class, unless it's confidential. There may be some issues there. You don't want to just post everything out there to, to uh, SlideShare. The second part of my digital checklist was really having a place for engagement. So this is really the center part of my blog. I can upload a video. This is actually an assignment for my marketing research class on ethnographic research. So, you know, hey, we talked about ethnographic research in this class. Here are some key things about ethnographic research. And here's a video that will inspire you as well. Watch this video. It was only three minutes long. And then give your comments. So you can see up there, there were two comments at that time. But this is actually where I'm having the students submit their work online in a blog. And that's probably different than what instructors do today. I don't know if it's the best thing, but I find it very engaging and they're actually using it. So, you know, maybe something that you want to try if you want to start using a blog in your class. And then um, one of the other things I talked about that I really wanted to include was links to relevant sites. And like I talked about, links to relevant sites, they're on demand, they're relevant. You can add more as needed and it's an all-in-one student resource. So they're not really going out hunting and gathering for things. If there's sites that are important to your class that you're teaching, 
Just go ahead and throw them on your blog as links so they can access to them at any time. And then one of the last things that I wanted to, t wanted to include in my blog was levels of engagement. And this is really to see how I'm doing as far as interacting with my classes. So are they using it? Um, they definitely are. So I see my students, like most students, but today are probably a little bit on the procrastination side. So I teach on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, and these are Tuesday and Wednesday nights, so. <coughs> Sorry about that, I have a <coughs> cold again. But you can see the level of engagement picks up as those classes, because there's often assignments due on those nights. So they're visiting on that day in a, in a big way versus the other time. So there's probably things that I could do next time I teach this class to keep the engagement going throughout the week. They are visiting it at other times, but clearly um, they're only visiting on the days that the assignments are due. But I, I wanted to measure that because if I can measure it, I could become a better instructor and learn from that. So I talked a little bit about this, and this is course sites. So I would um, highly recommend if you're an instructor or if you want to use this type of tool to visit this site. I will probably not use WordPress and probably use course sites in my next class. I think it's a dynamic tool. Um, it lets you do things like allow your students to instant message each, each other, which is, you know, that's a preferred way they like to communicate. So they can instant message each other in the classroom. You can add YouTube videos. You can add a Flickr account, you can add a, tw a Twitter account. You can actually build quizzes in course sites that are digital and um, you know, a student can take them in a couple minutes and they're graded automatically. It's, it's really a dynamic tool. Like I said, it's free. So I would definitely check out course sites. This is what I would call sort of my WordPress blog that I'm using now is me on my own. This is really an out of the box solution. So you don't have to be an expert at any of this stuff. You can start using it today. Um, so I think it's going to be a pretty important tool moving forward, and it's very similar to these sites like Coursera and the Stanford University online courses that are being used. Bless you. Hopefully, I didn't give you that cold. Hopefully. The rest of this presentation, um, I think we did good on time. Ask questions. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. But it just goes through some other examples of how instructors are using social media in their classroom. This is actually from a Point Park University instructor. I, I don't know. Heather Star Fielder, hopefully she's not here and I didn't. Um, but she's using Pinterest to sort of, um, <coughs> bless you, <laughs> everyone's sneezing today, it caused a problem. Um, but she's using Pinterest to sort of critique their work in a design class, which I found very interesting and another way to engage with students. So that's one of the reasons I'm checking out Pinterest because of tools like this. So good tool. Um, definitely want to uh, check her Pinterest account out if you want to. Another idea, if you're looking for a way, maybe not for you to engage with your students, but just to give them a different tool, is sort of the Google um, Google Hangouts. Has anyone used that before on a personal level? Everyone? So a couple people? So Google Hangouts is part of Google Plus, and you, it's like video chatting. If you know enough about that, you can give that to your students as, um, as another tool they can use in the classroom. Because if you're teaching, they're probably going to have a project due. They're probably going to use um, group work. You can actually have them work together wherever they are. You know, one person can be in the South Hills and North Hills if they're in Pittsburgh. I'm working with people in the, the Stanford class overseas. So I'm working with a student in France. That's how people hang out. It's helping me out on a personal level. But I think it's a great tool. It's one of those tools that you might want to just learn how to use and give that information to your students because they'll probably appreciate it a little bit. Yes? Don't forget, you can use Google Hangouts Air to broadcast yourself, and they can just watch and interact. But if Google Hangouts is the standard, you can only get like nine people on yeah. the call at one time. True. But if you use Google Air, you can get everybody can watch you. It's more of a one-sided thing about you broadcasting more than you interacting. So, as far as being a teacher, if you wanted to maybe broadcast. A seminar or a lesson that you were doing, and everybody can watch it. A note for updating on presentation. It's also good. Okay, very cool. I didn't know about that. So Google Air, nice. So you know you could use that tool. I, I was not aware of that. So very cool. Um, another tool you can use is create a hashtag or follow ones that um, are interesting to your class. I think I just did a search here for um, science. So if you know if you teach science, there's this hashtag called what is it called? Uh, science, science ed, 
in chemistry. So if you're just interested in getting information, maybe looking for hashtags on Twitter that are relevant to the class that you're teaching, or like I said, if you want to take it to the next level and actually engage with your students, at the beginning of class, before you even get started, create your class hashtag. So pound BMGT 311 point park, whatever it may be. So students can actually follow along and they can listen throughout the semester. They can work with each other to ask questions. They can ask you questions. And I like the hashtag approach versus having your students follow you on Twitter because they might feel a little bit uncomfortable about you following them and them following you. If you use a hashtag as an instructor, you never have to follow them, but you can still engage with them. So I think it might be a better approach versus making them follow you because a student probably won't have a personal Twitter account and a professional Twitter account. They're just going to have a, a personal Twitter account and they may get a little bit uncomfortable about you following them as your instructor. So the hashtag approach is definitely one that I'd recommend trying out if you want to use Twitter in the classroom. And those, those examples are um, just some that I have that pretty much wraps it up. I think the opportunities are endless with social media. It just requires that um, we as instructors learn, apply, and use these tools every day to sort of get better at them and um, engage with our students. Any questions? Your presentation, you linked, you sent out a link for it? I did. Okay. Yeah, and I'll send it again as well. Okay, um, great. Yes? So, um, what's the next thing you want to do? I don't know if you, or maybe besides Twitter, because you've already mentioned that. Yeah. But like, what's, um, what's something on the horizon for you that you want to bring? Um, I definitely want to have my students start engaging with each other, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to make that happen. I think that's an important piece of the puzzle because they're starting to engage with me, um, but they're not engaging with each other. And I think if they engage with each other, it can really improve their sort of learning experience. You know, um, I'd like to test the Twitter hashtag out because I've seen uh, even at work we have um, we have these quarterly presentations, right? And at the end of every quarterly presentation, our chief marketing officer stands up and says, does anyone have any questions? No one ever asks questions, ever. And um, I find the same thing in my classroom. They don't ask questions, so I don't know what they don't know or what they want to know. Um, but the last two, they put this technology in place where you can actually text questions. And since she's done that, there's been 20 questions a session. So I want to make sure in the classroom I'm using that Twitter hashtag and I'm saying, hey, as I'm teaching, you know, if you have a question on the content, what I'm talking about, ask it here and we'll go up, up over it after class. So I, I want to I make sure that I'm engaging with them and that they're engaging with each other. So those are where I, that's where I want to take um, what I've learned so far in social media um, to the next level. But that's a good, good question. But, yep. Since you mentioned that you might like Wikio. Wikio. It's an online platform to use as a group when you want to do group work. I used it over the summer for the first time. Okay. You were able to do conference calls or interact with your group. Okay. So it was kind of like head Twitter integrated. You can chat with each other, make calendar appointments, set a schedule, assign tasks to each other to get each other to communicate and collaborate in its own private platform. And it's free. Yeah. I like free. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. One of my classes, just one of them, they created a Facebook group, and there's a lot of um, interaction between students there. Yeah. And you can use the chat in that. But I heard someone say that they're phasing out groups in Facebook. I don't remember who said that. Someone said it yesterday, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But that. anyway, there's a lot of interaction so between the students there. Yeah. But yeah, Facebook's a good one. I mean, if your audience is on there, uh, definitely try that out. Um, the online class that I'm on in Coursera at Stanford, they have a Facebook page, and I go on there from time to time, but I usually follow the Twitter hashtag because that's just the, mm -hmm. the social media that I prefer. Yeah? Do you, um, um, do you ever get worried that like a student won't show up to class because all the stuff is on your blog? Sort of. Um, I do. Um, but. That's one of the reasons why, and I don't know if it's standard practice at the business school here at Point Park, but we make them sign sort of a, um, I forget what we called it, student, um, it's sort of a student agreement where they sign it and say, they'll show up to class, they'll be professional, they won't be late, and I actually made them sign that before each class, clearly notifying them of points that will be deducted if they don't show up to class. Um, I think that is a worry, but I, um, I think the benefits outweigh that worry because they still want to come to class but I want to provide them tools that they can learn 
on their own as well. But I think there's that concern because they could definitely download all this stuff and maybe learn more that I could teach them in the classroom. But I think um, putting both together is sort of a, a good way to go. But you need to be careful of that. Yes? Do you think the physical classroom will completely go away? Not in the near future, but in the eventual future? And it will all be virtual? That's a really great question. <laughs> it, it's really good. I think, um, I hope not, um, because then I might be out of my part-time job. Um, I, I could see that happening um, with technology like Coursera and some of the online schools. Um, that The technology, I, me as a person, I'm learning more than I probably ever have learned in the classroom. So there is that risk. Um, but I still think you need the instructor behind it, you need the engagement. But I, I think it's a possibility. I don't think short term, but I think maybe 10 years down the road. Yes? Uh, I just want to sort of comment on that on that aspect. Uh, I think during the, the 90s, there was sort of this push or this thought that you know maybe telecommunications could get everyone out of their office. We could all work from home. Yeah. And I think there might be, you know, that that sort of dream hasn't really panned out the way, the way some people have thought. Yeah. I think there might be some parallels there in terms of, like, there's some person-to-person -person interactions that you can't really substitute you know, through Twitter and Facebook, but that those are extra tools that can sort of overlay, you know, the base experience and definitely modify it, but I don't think the, like, in-person classrooms are going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. I think it'll be more of a luxury item. Yeah. The technology or the classroom? Going, going to campus, living on campus will become more of a luxury item so people can really afford the experience and yeah. everybody else will log online and take classes. See, I feel... Um, I feel like we're not teaching kids, and I'm, I'm a high school teacher, so I feel like this is a high school thing, maybe not a college thing, but we don't teach them how to work together, and that's something they lack, yeah. and they, they need to be able to do in, um, in careers and things like that. So I get really worried when you talk about eliminating the physical space that you share to learn to be together. No, it's okay. I get, I get worried, too. I mean, we might be going down that path because of cost, but I think it is important because I think one of the biggest things that my students need help with is communication skills in general. So presenting and working with others and talking, even um, writing communication skills as far as what's professional and what's not. No, you don't email your instructor and say B for B letter for number. It's just not the right thing to do, but I'm starting to see this stuff. Well, then if you... Um Th that's my why I don't want to use Twitter with my students because I don't want it ever to be a space where it's okay to um, not use real word or like you know <laughs> academic language because they don't use it enough to get comfortable with it. So that's one of the reasons, at least in high school, that I'm, I'm and the emailing is just out of control. Yeah, well they hate email. Uh, students at college they hate email. They don't use it. Um, you gave the example when Deanna guest spoke in my class. Um, there's a couple universities that are eliminating emails altogether. Yeah, that video for sure. Yeah, so students aren't using email, and even in the workplace when they're coming in, they hate email and they're not using it. Um, so a lot of companies are using sort of high-level versions of SharePoint where you can post the information and they can get it on demand. Email, if you think about it, if you think about email, email is marketing that was popular 10 years ago. It's TV that's push. You're pushing information to people, right? SharePoint is loading it, and then people pull it down when they want it. So it's information on demand. And that's why I like some, some of this technology and using this content, because it's really taking what's the best things about social media is pulling information when they want it, and that's sort of the style that they learn best with. So good discussion. I mean, a lot of this makes me nervous. I would hate to see the, the classroom eliminated, because again, they're struggling with communication skills. You want to make sure they work good in groups, because if you have a student that attends this online classroom and it's virtual and it's blogging, they're still going to have to enter the workforce and the workforce is still somewhere where they're going to have to work together, they're going to have to work in projects, they're going to have to work together. So I think maybe a combination of all of these tools would, would be a good solution for everyone. And I think too, like from a non-teaching perspective, you just lose that. Like you were talking about the college experience or the being on right. campus or the high school experience being together, that's part of school. Yeah. It's, not the academic part, but the actual being with people and interaction. The networking part to build your followers exactly. and friends. If you're sitting in, I'm an introvert. If I sit behind my screen all day, I love it. But 
but I wouldn't know anybody yeah, else to really exactly. connect with. So it yeah. actually makes social media pointless after a while. You gotta actually interact with other humans. I've been reading this week on Forbes, there was a company that banned internal emails for a week. I saw that. I saw that too. And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, and it's all behind because of poor work ethic and work quality, but man and email is not going to actually necessarily help that. Mm -hmm. But educating kids and students about using it. I think to her point, we need to also educate kids about using technology properly. Yes. You know, like, you don't snap pictures of yourself and post them all over the world for everybody to see yeah. and know good forms because eventually one day that might come back. Yeah. Yeah. That's another discussion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that 100%. But yeah, that's a whole nother discussion on professional use and making sure they're ready for it. But no, the, the, um, I read that Forbes article as well. And I think, um, I think that's an extreme example, but I also think it's a good example because it forced them to get up out of their seats and talk to each other that they work with. I mean, there's often times where, you know, I work in sort of cube land and my boss sits behind me, which is awkward just because it is, but she'll email me and I'm literally sitting right there. I'm like, hey, yeah, it's done. You know, we could have just talked about that. So I, I'm not a big fan of email either. Um, I think it, it's needed, but I think we just use it as a crutch too much. Much sort of CYA, cover your ass, I'll send an email, and that way I won't have to worry about it anymore if I send it versus talking to you. We do that a lot through uh, Instant Messenger. Yeah. 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 Yeah their careers in the workplace, I want to engage them better. And again, this is changing. This is going to be, if I did this presentation next year, it might be completely different. Um, you just need to stay on top of the tools that are out there, learn how to use them, and really learn how you want to engage with your students and you know, who, you're, who you're working with. And um, that's going to make you a better teacher and instructor. You teach high school, so I don't have a lot of experience with that. And I'm sure you have separate rules of what you can do and can't do. Um. You know, I ask for forgiveness before permission. <laughs> That's kind of. I like that. I do the same thing. Um, uh, one of the good tips I, I, I learned while I was doing the research on this presentation was on in high school. One of the things that are best practices are setting up that Twitter account and setting up that hashtag and letting the students' parents follow you, mm. so they're up to date on what you're teaching and when and what to do, because they just want to be engaged. They want to learn, and they're on these tools as well. So um, I can send out that resource as well. I thought that was pretty, pretty good one. All right, that's Professor Blogger. Thank you. Thanks for. I really appreciate you coming and asking all the questions that you did. And um, again, follow me on Twitter. Connect me on LinkedIn if you have any other questions. Feel free to send them my way, and I'll try to get out all the material that I presented today out. <laughs>